so the next talk we have is a, a half an hour with uh, John Sebastian. Uh, he's going to give us an introduction to telescopes and mounts. Good. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is uh, Jean-Sébastien Godet. So I'll be talking today about uh, telescopes and mounts, just introducing everybody to uh, the astronomer's uh, all favorite tool. Um, so here we have um, a new user who is very frustrated with his new mount. So we're gonna try to, uh, to avoid that. Um, so telescopes, what is a telescope? Well, telescope is a tool that helps us see things that appear very dim or very small. Now we say appear very dim or very small because a lot of the things in the sky um, are, not, are neither dim or small. If you were very close to them, they just look that way to us because they're, a lot of these things are very far. So a telescope, we use a telescope for two basic functions. It's to collect more, more light than your eye can collect. So. Uh, if, you, if you think of your um, your eye, it's very small. A uh, telescope is very big. You collect a lot more light with a telescope. And it also helps us focus the light into an image that we can see, either with our eyes or uh, with, a, with a camera attached to a telescope, for example. Um, there are two main types of telescopes. There's a refracting telescope, so that's a telescope that uses uh, lenses, or a reflecting telescope, and that's a telescope that uses mirrors. So some important numbers to know about telescopes. The first one is aperture, and that's the that's how big your telescope is. That's the, the, the diameter of the main lens or the main mirror. And that determines the light gathering ability as well as the resolution. Um, so again, comparing that to, to, uh, to a human eye, a human uh, uh, pupil, um, the aperture of a telescope is much larger than that. So it allows a lot more light to be gathered. And, And then the next next important number to know is the focal length. So, and that's the distance from the main main mirror to the focused image. Uh, you can think of that as well as a, a camera, for example. Um, uh, if you have a an SLR camera, you have a 50 millimeter lens or a, a 200 millimeter zoom. Uh, telescopes, we also use the same numbers, and that uh, determines how the magnification, as well as the field of view that you can uh, see in your telescope. Uh, and, and the focal ratio, and, and then there's the focal ratio, which is the the length, of, the focal length of the telescope, and that's divided by the aperture. And that, in other words, that that determines the light gathering efficiency um, or the image brightness of of your that your telescope can achieve. Again, if you think of that as a as a, a, a camera, um, you have different f-stops in your camera, and that that's kind of what it is for a telescope. Um, magnification, so. Often, um, um, you, you know, you, you see telescopes being sold uh, with mag high magnification numbers in them, and, and we'll, we're going to dive a bit here into what exactly is magnification and what's important about that. So the, the power uh, and the magnification of a telescope is, you can determine that, you can calculate that by dividing the focal length by the eyepiece. So your, your telescope is, all, is always, well, mostly always is the fixed focal length. And you change the magnification by changing the the eyepiece that you insert into, uh, into your telescope, and that determines the magnification. So, uh, and um, in general, more magnification, the object appears larger, but also may not be as sharper or dimmer. You may have uh, a different contrast depending on on what you're looking at. And uh, useful magnification. And that's a good magnification you can use with your telescope. That's limited by your the, the aperture. So aperture again is the how big your main lens or mirror is. A uh, good rule of thumb is about 50, uh, 50 times aperture in inches. So let's say um, a small uh, three-inch uh, telescope. You know, we could maybe go up to one hundred fifty times magnification. Any larger than that, you're not getting any you're not getting any uh, advantage out of it. You're you're just making the image more fuzzy, basically. Um, and also magnification is limited by the, the atmosphere, by the seeing. So there's lots of, lots of uh, currents in the atmosphere, lots of, lots of air, high altitude winds, all this kind of stuff that limits the, the, uh, this, uh, the, the useful magnification that you can see. 
you think of it, if you're if you're uh, you're trying to look at an object or a planet, well, usually a planet, for example, when you're trying to use a very high magnification to see a planet, uh, you, between the same conditions between two nights, if one is good seeing or bad seeing, you may see some details one night that you can't see in another one. And that's, uh, again, so that's how seeing affects magnification. Um, so now more details, uh, a refracting telescope. So again, that's a telescope that uses lenses. So refraction is, is the light changing direction when it's passing from one medium to another. For example, air to glass. Uh, we can see here, that's a kind of a, a cutout of a, of a telescope. You see where the, the light enters the, the telescope and then is, is bent by the lens. It's refracted by the lens and then focused into the eyepiece, uh, into uh, the observer's eye. Um, you can kind of, uh, if you understand a refraction, if you if you um, if you go to a pool, if you go swimming, and you put your something in the water, you'll see that if it's um, the light kind of changes direction. So if you put like a long a, a stick, you put a stick in the water, you look at it in the air, and it sort of looks like it bends in the water. It doesn't actually bend, but but the light is is bending. That's because water is also a different medium that will change uh, the direction of light. So that's a that's a, ref, a refracting telescope. Now, refractor pros and cons. Uh, refractors can be very inexpensive. A lot of uh, beginner beginners will will uh, will buy uh, inexpensive refractors, and, and that and that's fine. Usually, those are those are achromatic refractors. And achromatic refers to uh, the the setup of the lens. We'll we'll talk about that a bit later in the telescope. Um, they can be small, small in size, uh, so portable. Uh, short focal lengths. So again, the focal length affects the you know, the, the field of view, the, the zoom of the, of, of, the, of the telescope. So you can have a wide field of view um, and you have, uh, it yields very good contrast. A con, uh, they can also be very expensive. Um, so the, the, there are types of refractors called the apochromatics or apos that you, you hear them referred to as. Uh, these use very, um, very, I guess, expensive uh, build, uh, and they're usually very good quality. So they mainly used for, for I think, for photographic applications, but also for, for visual. Uh, but those tend to be more expensive, um, well, a lot more expensive than just your basic uh, ac acro telescope, achromatic. Um, long focal lengths make the, the, the telescope long, uh, very long and heavy. So uh, you, you're, you're limited. The, the lens, lenses get very big and, and heavy the larger your telescope is. So you have a kind of a limitation with that. Most, most very, very large telescopes uh, don't, don't tend to be refractors uh, because of that. Um, and refractors also introduce some aberrations or distortions. So they don't reproduce the, the image, uh, you know, exactly as, as, as seen. The, while the light passing through the medium is, is somewhat distorted and that's, uh, that's called chrom chromatic uh, aberration. And there's also uh, uh, other aberrations. We'll, we'll talk about chromatic aberration a bit later. Um, so yeah, so here about the chromatic aberration. So what we're showing here is that, you know, a perfect lens on the left here would bend all wavelengths of light, all colors of light um, equally and focus them at, at, at a point, at, at the focus point. Uh, but uh, because of uh, you know the laws of physics, not all wavelengths are, um, bend at the same the same way while passing through medium. So they don't all focus at the same point. So the the blue light, the green light, the red light doesn't all focus at the same point. And you can see below in the image um, what that would look like uh, in a telescope that suffers from from uh, chromatic aberration. Um, I actually noticed that myself as well with uh, with my glasses because you know you're if you wear glasses you're actually using a lens that refracts light and and oftentimes depending on uh, the type of lens you're wearing uh, you may see around uh, high contrast so like say uh, something bright uh, next to something dark you might see some some fringing like this some blue or or, or orange fringing and that and that's chromatic aberration. Um, on the right here, we see a, an achromatic doubler. So that's a that's a type of um, refract. So I think most refractors that are sold are like this. They're not just a single lens, but there's another another lens that that corrects that corrects a little bit the um, the bending of the light, and that yields a better, a sharper image with less 
chromatic aberration, but still doesn't completely eliminate it. Uh, you can kind of tell the, the rays are not all focusing at, at one point. Okay. Um, Right, so so the yes, right, so the Acromat is, is our, our basic telescope that we were that I was talking about uh, improves chromatic aberration and then um, an ED Acromat, so that's a low dispersion uh, glass uh, achromatic refractor. It's it's better than a, just a regular achromatic. It's not quite the same, um, uh, I guess, visual quality as a apple chromatic, but it's it's, it's a very good improvement over your, over your basic uh, achromat refractor. And here we had the last one is, is like I was saying, an apochromatic, apo. So uh, that's a, it's a very special glass, usually three or more elements, yields the best performance. Um, but again, very, uh, usually usually a lot more expensive than your basic uh, achromat refractor. And that's your, your scale on the left here. As <laughs> so next we have uh, reflecting telescopes. So reflecting telescopes using mirrors. So re reflection is, is light bouncing off a surface, smooth surface in a predictable way. So angle in, angle out. Uh, so here you have um, primary, the light entering the telescope, hitting a primary mirror, reflecting onto the secondary, which usually secondary is flat, and then uh, into the eyepiece for, for observing. So pros and cons of uh, reflectors. Well, pros, they're lowest cost per unit aperture. So um, you can get a very large re reflector telescope and that usually for very, very affordable, at least compared to the, the equivalent uh, um, reflector telescope. Uh, because they don't use lens or pure reflectors don't, don't use lenses, they do not suffer from chromatic, chromatic aberration. So they don't, uh, they don't bend uh, different wavelengths of light in different uh, ways. Uh, you can also have long focal lengths um, for, for reflectors without suffering a, a very big penalty like you would for, uh, for um, uh, reflect, uh, refractors uh, in terms of weight or portability. Uh, for the cons, um, the mirrors have to be aligned. So that's, um, that's called a collimation. Um, they must be aligned, otherwise you, you, you'll get a, a fuzzy image. And, and that's... Uh, you, you know, you can you align it once, it might last uh, a while. I usually check every every time I bring my telescope out, I, I usually check the, the alignment to make sure I'm, I'm getting a good focus and good good alignment. But it is a bit of a hassle. It's not like a, ref, a reflector where you can just take it out and, and start observing. Um, so they take longer to come to stable temperature. So when you bring a, a large telescope outside, a large reflector, um, the difference in temperature between uh, where you brought it out of, so if you brought it out of your house uh, and it's a lot warmer than say the uh, outdoors, it, it, it's gonna take a bit of time to, to get to temperature. And the time it takes to do that, you may not get a very sharp image until it does uh, reach temperature. Uh, you do suffer from shape related aberrations. So depending on the, um, the focal ratio that we talked about earlier, depending on the focal ratio of your telescope, you, you, could, you can get some, um, some aberrations uh, um, so, such as, uh, as coma, for example. And that's, that's just stars that don't quite reach in focus uh, at the edges of the image. Uh, the central second mirror reduces contrast. So what we mean by that is if you, um, if you remember the previous slide where you had uh, let's see. We had a secondary mirror. The second mir secondary mirror is actually in the way of the light entering the telescope, so it does block a bit of the light entering the telescope, and that and that kind of that, that reduces contrast. Okay. So next we have compound reflectors. So those are are um, reflectors that use you know they're not pure reflectors. Some of them use um, you know l lenses or things like that, or they're just, they're different than just standard, your standard reflector. So on the top left, we have uh, a schmidt cassegrain So that's another very popular uh, telescope. Uh, the advantage of that one is that it's very, it's very compact for the focal length that you're getting. So your focal length is typically actually three times the, uh, the length of the tube. So it's a good way to get a, a portable uh, large telescope. Then you have uh, variations on that. So on, on uh, Maskutov, or Maksutov Cassegrains or Richie Critchains. Richie Critchains are usually, I think I've seen them more used for, for, uh, 
or astrophotography, but um, those are other types of refle uh, reflectors. So how do you pick a telescope if you don't already have one? Well, how much are you able or willing to spend? That's always, uh, I guess, <laughs> the first question is, how much invested uh, do you want to be in this? How much do you want to spend on your telescope? Uh, what do you want to look at? So typically there's no one size fits all. Usually we have a different telescope for, for, uh, for depending on what you want to do with it. Um, objects in the sky are not all the same size. Uh, you can have very small uh, galaxies or planetary nebulae, nebula, for example, or um, a large, for example, or a large nebula or, or moon or the moon or things like that. You may want to have a different focal length telescope. So it depends uh, what you want to do with your telescope. Uh, where and how, how often will you use it? Um, for example, it'd be nice. It's nice to get a very, very large telescope. You get a lot of light gathering ability, has a lot of a lot of features, but if it's just too heavy to lug around and to, too long to set up, you may not may not use it very often. A uh, small uh, refractor, for example, maybe is something that's portable. It's easy to just uh, just take out, put on your deck, and or, or uh, you know put on your driveway, start observing. So that's another consideration. Uh, but in, at the end of the day, the best telescope is the one that you're actually going to use. So so it doesn't matter if you if you get uh, you know something that's that's very inexpensive uh, but does the job if it's that's the one you, you can use that's when you're comfortable using it and you bring out every every night that's clear then that's it's a good telescope to for you so the second part so now we've co we've covered the uh, the optical the basics of uh, of the optical portion of the telescope before the, before the mounts uh, right? s uh, JS, we have a question about the difference between the SC and the RC uh, reflectors. C and RC. Yeah, the, the uh, uh, Smith yeah. Cassie Green and the Richly Kachan. So I, I'm not an expert on those types no. of telescopes, but I think it's it's the, uh, the 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 curvature of the primary mirror. I guess is the is the main the main difference. Um, you have a, a primary mirror, I think, which is usually spherical on Schmidt-Cassegrain's grains, and a hyperbolic uh, primary mirror on uh, RCs. Uh, okay, thanks. I can, I can add a little bit to that. Yeah. Uh, so the, the Schmidt-Cassegrain became very popular because um, the Celestron, which is one of the first companies to sell them commercially, found a way of making a primary mirror really cheaply a high quality mirror and it had a lot to do with the shape of the mirror so i believe the mirror is uh spherical if i'm not mistaken so it's the shape of a sphere but then they put a corrector lens in front of it if you see the thing called corrector plate in this image so it's actually uh a, t a bit of a corrective optics that helps uh, uh correct for the fact that the mirror is spherical and a spherical mirror does not focus light to a point. So the combination of the corrector plate and the spherical primary mirror is what makes that telescope work and makes it inexpensive to manufacture. The Ritchie Kretchen, instead of trying to correct the light to accommodate the primary, they, they actually just went for the ideal mirror shape, which is hyperbolic. So the, the light that is uh, focused by that mirror is, uh, it's all in focus. It has very much reduced uh, aberrations uh, right to the edge of the field. So they, they, uh, the secondary is also hyperbolic. So the combination of those two more complex curve shapes gives you a, a much uh, sharper image from edge to edge of the picture, which makes them uh, desirable for astrophotography, but also for research. So most of the research telescopes now are uh, Richie Kretchen, including the Hubble telescope. But the, the trade-off is the mirrors are much more expensive to make. I was gonna say that's, <laughs> maybe that's why they're not so as popular. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Jim. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Okay. 
Uh, so, okay, so now, uh, yeah, right. So we've covered the optical uh, portion of telescopes. Now we're gonna talk about mounts. So what are you mounting your, your telescope on? Um, you have two basic types of mounts. So you have a altitude azimuth mount or ALTAS as, as you'll hear it being referred to as, or a, a ger and the second one is a German, German equatorials or a GEM, GEM mount. Um, so both of these can be manual uh, which means you just uh, basically orient yourself, um, push the telescope around on the mount. They could be motorized, uh, so they can um, either track the stars uh, automatically or computer controlled, so you can uh, connect your mount to, uh, to a computer, has motors, and then you can, uh, you know, like a go-to telescope, for example, you have, ask it to point somewhere, it's gonna move automatically. Um, your telescope and your, the type of observing you do is going to define the amount that you need. So, if you're doing some, um, you know, high precision uh, astrophotography, for example, you may want a, a very precise, motorized equatorial mount. If you, uh, when we we're talking about earlier, the telescopes uh, that you use, that you use is the one you have. Um, if you want to just, you know, grab and go telescope, you may want something on the simple uh, altitude azimuth mount, not, not motorized. You should just pop it out and start observing right away. So on, on the altazimuth mount, so um, I guess these are two typical two typical setups um, for altitude azimuth mounts. Uh, on, on the left here, we have uh, a very typical um, a refractor, for example, on an altazimuth mount. Uh, altitude means, uh, you know, so your point is, so it's, it's from, uh, zenith would be right, right above you. So it goes from the horizon to the zenith. And azimuth is the orientation. Uh, so depending, uh, you know, north, south, east, west. Uh, a, a Dobsonian mount, that's usually, uh, so that's for reflectors usually, where um, your, your telescope sits on a base which rotates uh, kind of on its base and also up and down the altitude axis. So it's two different, but it's basically the same, the same setup, the same functionality, just two different uh, setups. And then we have uh, equatorial telescopes. Um, so the equatorial telescopes allow you to track uh, track the movement of the stars as the Earth uh, rotates. Um, so you'll have uh, the axis, the polar axis, which is you know, pointed to the North Celestial Pole, and then uh, the declination axis, which is um, the axis the orthogonal to that. Uh, an equatorial fork mount on, on the right is another another setup, another implementation of, of that. Um, right. So some uh, manual mounts. So you can see here, these are all types of manual mounts. Uh, on, on the left here, we have a reflector, uh, a reflector with the manual, uh, on an equatorial mount with the manual fine control. So you would turn the knobs to, to turn, turn the telescope uh, finely, you know, as, as the uh, stars are moving across your, your field of view to, to keep those in track. On the top, we have a very typical uh, Altaz push-pull uh, reflector on, a, on an Altaz mount. So again, that's that's very easy to just uh, kind of assemble, bring outside, and start uh, observing. On the right, we have uh, a Dobson Dobsonian push-pull um, telescope. Again, it's a that's a reflector, and just uh, it's, a, it's a reflector. So it's the same same optics uh, optical setup as the one on the on the left, uh, the blue one, uh, but it's on a different different mount uh, on a base like this. Uh, so for mounts that are driven or mo motor driven, um, you have, you know, fork type mounts, um, uh, alt azimuth mounts. So th those are, so those are all, uh, th so the three on the, on the left are altitude azimuth or alt -az mounts. Uh, go to refers to, um, so that's a functionality in a lot of telescopes that, that are sold that allow you to um, uh, align your telescope. So you point out a few stars, then the computer kind of knows where it's, the, the computer and telescope knows where it's pointing, and then you can ask it to see. I want to see uh, Venus uh, or uh, different star clusters, things like that. Uh, objects that are in the, in the database of your telescope. It's a great way to, to learn to learn uh, learn the sky. Uh, and on the right, you have uh, equatorial go to. So again, that's um, an equatorial mount, but uh, computerized, so it tracks tracks the stars. So, JS, I've got a couple of questions, so let me know right. when you want to answer them. 
Uh, I, I can so have about I can... five minutes left, I think. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll just uh, I'll just uh, go through the, the rest and then uh, take a question okay. after. Yeah, just let me know. Okay. Uh, so Altaz versus EQ. So again, Altitude Azimuth, simple, easy to set up and use. Uh, they track in two axes, so it's just like a stair step as the because the Earth uh, as the Earth uh, rotates, the view rotate, but the view rotates actually. And that's uh, just a consequence of the way uh, stars moving across the sky, depending on your latitude. They're great for visual. Um, you can do some imaging, some photography, short exposure only, and that's mainly because of the uh, the, the field rotation, uh, the rotation and, that you would see in your images. Uh, equatorials are more complex and set up uh, to set up and use. Uh, they require counterweights. Uh, there's also meridian flips to deal with. I won't really get into that, but that's just. Uh, as your telescope is pointing at a certain point of the sky, you you have to change, uh, you have to flip your telescope around. Otherwise, you may uh, the telescope may interfere with some of the, your your equipment or, or the mount. It only needs to track in one axis, uh, and it's great for visual imaging. Uh, and and any of these two setups can be uh, set up with go to mounts, so they're very capable and affordable. Um, it's easy to set up and start finding objects. So uh, lastly, how do you pick um, a mount? Well, you want to minimize fiddling in the dark. So a lot of these go-to uh, telescopes, you know, their keypads are a bit illuminated, so it's easy to to point at what you want. Uh, you want a solid, reliable support for your scope. So if you have a very heavy, heavy telescope on a you know, flimsy mount, it's going to be very difficult to observe anything. Uh, your, your view is going to shift around and, and vibrate a lot. Uh, at the end of the day, your money is well spent on a good quality mount something that's solid and sturdy and uh, meets your needs. Uh, so yeah, I can take questions now. Uh, if there's any... Great, yeah. So yeah. the first, first question's a good one. Do you have to have some physics knowledge to use telescopes? This is a question from Daniel. Physics knowledge. Uh, well, I don't think you need, uh, you know, you don't need a physics degree, certainly. Um, mm. I mean, you don't... Mm. Uh, we, we were all beginners at this at one point or another, and, and you just kind of learn as you go. Um, certainly, I don't think you need a very depth. You don't really need a knowledge of physics, I don't think, to, to use a telescope. I mean, at the end of the day, you're looking, as long as you have it set up, uh, aligned, and and your your lenses or mirrors are good, um, and you follow the instructions, you don't, I, I guess I guess not. You don't really need to <laughs> knowledge of physics, I guess. Well, I, I have personally, well, if I could chime in, I have no yeah. knowledge of physics whatsoever. I'm a, oh, there you great, go. <laughs> I'm a great math phobe for sure. But what I've really found is having good mentorship, like through a club or, or friends or whatever, that's key. That was key for me, and it still is. Agreed. Anyway, um, the other question from Dennis is, is uh, a Masukov cast a grain with spherical or parabolic mirrors? more of a technical question there. Oh, you. I'm not sure if somebody else wants to feel that one. I'm not super familiar with that type. But. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Maxitoff telescope, all surfaces are spherical. It's very cool. Yeah, okay. Great. And that answer was given by Attila, our next speaker, which is a beautiful <laughs> segue into more detail on telescopes. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe uh, so maybe, much, yes. Yeah, we'll... Uh, we'll uh, any final words before we turn yeah, it over to Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I was gonna say uh, how do you pick a telescope? I mean, uh, in normal times, we'd say uh, have a look through a bunch of different telescopes. Uh, you know, go to a star party, uh, go to a club meeting or observing session where a lot of members or a lot of astronomers bring out their telescopes and try it out and talk to us. Uh, and it's probably the best way to, to get a feel for what, what's right for you to pick a telescope. Great. Thank you so much. Okay.